All right, Angel. She grew up in Minnesota and attending public school and then went to Brigham Young University where she studied and earned a bachelor's degree in uh, psychology. She's been studying principles of education and business for eight years. She's fascinating to talk to and I'm excited you get to hear from her today. She has um, homeschooled all along and her children are 11, 7, and 3. This is Angel. I was crying when, during both Claire's and Tiffany's talk, so I was like hoping I would dry up by the time I get up here, but I might burst into tears again while I'm talking. Um, I've been thinking so much lately, probably the past year, about um, um, how much disconnect there is in our lives today. Um, and Claire and Tiffany kind of touched on some areas of disconnect, or at least from my perspective. Um, Claire talking about how we've disconnected spirituality from secular learning, when really they're one and the same. We, sh we need to remesh those. Um, and then Tiffany talking about um, how we've disconnected learning from family. That learning is something you do in a separate building with a stranger, somebody who you are assigned to, who doesn't know you, and family is not involved except for to fulfill that teacher's checklist. I'm making sure that you're doing what the teacher wants you to do. But today I would like to talk about the, uh, how knowledge has been fragmented into bits, disconnected from each other and real life, and how we can mend those fragments back together into a beautiful whole, yielding a, an abundance of rich learning experiences. When Sofia Kovalevskaya was a young girl, she said she loved poetry with a passion. Its very form, its very rhythm delighted me. I greedily devoured every excerpt from Russian poets that caught my eye. The very beat of poetry enchanted me so much that I began composing at the age of five. By the age of 12, I was unshakably convinced that I was going to become a great poet. She did eventually become a poet and an inter internationally recognized playwright as well, but only in her spare time. Her main contribution to the world was in mathematics. She wrote in her autobiography, you are surprised at my working simultaneously in literature and mathematics. Many people who have never had occasion to learn what mathematics really is, confuse it with arithmetic and consider it a dry and arid science. In actual fact, it is the science which demands the utmost imagination it is impossible to be a mathematician without also being a poet in spirit. The poet must see what others do not see, must see more deeply than other people, and the mathematician must do the same. In the real world, knowledge is not compartmentalized into neat little packages called subjects. Physiologist Claude Bernard said it well, everything in nature is connected to everything else. In their book, Sparks of Genius, Robert and Michelle Root Bernstein believe that ever-increasing specialization is clearly leading to a fragmentation of knowledge. People today have so much information and so little grasp of its origins, meanings, and uses that overall comprehension has frayed beyond repair. But how did knowledge become fragmented in the first place? Our story begins with a single invention. At the time he invented it, in 1797, Eli Whitney couldn't have known that it would eventually permeate almost every aspect of our lives, even the way we learn and think. It is the factory assembly line. The defining characteristic of the assembly line is the compartmentalization of tasks and organizing them in a linear fashion. On an assembly line, goods could be produced faster, more cheaply, and identically. The economy flourished. In the late 19th century, John Dewey applied this assembly line model to the training and education of the masses. 
His legacy? Factory-like school buildings with halls and lockers, bells to signal when students should move from one cell to the next, classes segregated by age, taught by so-called experts who are also to be rulers. In 1912, John D. Rockefeller published a mission statement for his own General Board of Education, in which he wrote, in our dream, people yield themselves with perfect docility to our molding hands. We shall not try to make these people or any of their children into philosophers or men of learning or men of science. We will organize our children and teach them to do in a perfect way what their fathers and mothers are doing in an imperfect way. The problem with applying the assembly line model to human beings is our children are not soulless, inanimate objects waiting to be assembled with all the same parts, all the same bits of knowledge on an assembly line. We are each born with distinct gifts and purposes. We develop our own interests and desires. While cars may thrive by being produced on, a, on an assembly line, human beings do not thrive being produced on an assembly line. We need a new paradigm for education, one that views learning as an organic process and knowledge as part of an ecosystem. An ecosystem is defined as a biological community of interacting organisms and their physical environment. In nature, all elements of an ecosystem depend upon each other for survival. Knowledge is no different. One way knowledge has been fragmented is breaking up whole ideas and experiences into subjects. I would like to propose a revolutionary new way to eat a chocolate chip cookie. Pretend you've never tasted a chocolate chip cookie before and imagine yourself eating it as I describe it. First, you eat a few tablespoons of flour. It's dry at first, then it gets a little gluey, but you manage to choke it down. Then you eat an egg, cooked or raw, I'll let you choose. Then you eat the sugar, kind of uh, granulated feeling in your mouth, followed by a sip of vanilla extract, a spoonful of greasy butter, a spoonful of baking soda, a spoonful of salt. Now for the good part, the chocolate chips. But I'm gonna break that down for you too. First you eat the cocoa powder, then the cocoa butter, then a shot of vanilla extract, chased by a spoonful of soybean oil. Finish it up with a dash of soy lecithin, whatever that is. <laughs> Did you enjoy my chocolate chip cookie? It's really the best chocolate chip cookie recipe ever. Of course, it's not a chocolate chip cookie at all, even though you consumed the exact same ingredients. This is how we present bits of knowledge to students. But eating them as a whole in perfect balance makes for an entirely different experience. Remember the words of Dewey and Montessori, how we learn influences learning more than the actual curriculum, which is why this paradigm shift is crucial. Imagine this scenario. You come across mention of the Chernobyl nuclear disaster, a whole experience, and decide that this is an event worth exploring with your children. You do a little research and find a fictional but historic, historically and scientific, scientifically accurate account of the disaster as a starting point. You cuddle up with your children, reading, but your minds and hearts are not in the living room. You are in the control room of reactor number four with your comrades during a routine systems check. Your colleague makes a serious mistake, causing the reaction to spiral out of control. You can see in your mind's eye the uranium atoms, sorry, the uranium atoms hitting each other and splitting, the energy growing exponentially, finally blowing the lid off the reactor like a geyser of poison. Your heart beats so hard against your chest, you can hardly think straight. But you know you have two choices. You can run and try to save your life, or you can stay and do everything in your power to stop the reaction from getting too far out of control, knowing that you will most likely die and leave your family behind. Around you, even though you know they are invisible to the human eye, 
you can see them penetrating your body right down to your DNA, changing its structure. You lay in your hospital bed with your comrades. You feel the radiation sickness. You feel the cancer consume your body. This is what the term gamma rays means to you. They're not just squiggly lines at the end of a spectrum. You understand them here, not just here. You were in the orphanage caring for the children of women who were exposed to the gamma rays. You see the physical manifestation of the mutation of their DNA. You feel a great love for them. You wonder why their mothers couldn't raise them or if the children believed that their mothers didn't want them because their bodies are deformed. You are a little girl playing at home in Pripyat, just outside of Kiev, two days after the meltdown. A soldier comes to your door and gives you a few minutes warning to evacuate your home and board a bus to Kiev, leaving everything behind. You are told you will only be gone two or three days. How do you feel when you discover that the nuclear, nearby nuclear power plant had been poisoning the air and land and people of your city for two days and your government had intentionally been keeping it a secret from you. When you arrive in Kiev, your head is shaved and you are given old but uncontaminated clothing. Everyone stares at you, keeping their distance so you don't contaminate them. The other children say cruel things about you at school. They call you shiny because your head is bald. All you want is to be back in the comfort of your own home with your friends, your dog, and your dad, who gave his life in an attempt to save others. Now let's break down the Chernobyl nuclear disaster assembly line style. Eighth grade world history class. The Chernobyl disaster was a catastrophic nuclear accident that occurred on the 26th of April, 1986 at the Chernobyl nuclear power plant in Ukraine of the Soviet Union. Ninth grade civics class. For the test, you must be able to define communism and explain how it works. You must know who invented the system. Tenth grade biology class. For the test, you must know what DNA stands for, the four amino acids it is composed of, and what determines which genetic traits show up in offspring. 11th grade chemistry class. Uranium is a silvery white metallic chemical element in the actinide series of the periodic table with symbol U and atomic number 92. Can you picture yourself in school like going through the, your three by five cards like, okay, atomic number 92, okay, okay. Uh, math class, exponential growth, statistics. 12th grade physics class. Nuclear fission is either a nuclear reaction or a radioactive decay process in which the nucleus of an atom splits into smaller parts. Optional 12th grade psychology class. Fight or flight response, post-traumatic stress disorder. Bits of information presented years apart, disconnected from their natural context, their ecosystem. Salcon founder of Khan Academy, says, it was not by accident that whole ideas were broken up into fragmented subjects. Subjects could be learned by rote memorization, whereas mastering larger ideas called for free and unbridled thinking. In the Chernobyl example, we were able to mend these fragments of knowledge back into their context of a whole idea or experience. But even whole ideas and experiences don't live in neat little compartments by themselves. They too live within a larger ecosystem connected to other whole ideas and experiences. And when one whole idea or experience grows into another, which grows into another, sequentially, I call this a learning tree. Two Christmases ago, our whole family was in the car listening to Christmas music on the radio. When a song came on called Simply Having a Wonderful Christmas Time by the Beatles. The girls grew to love it and would get excited every time it came on. I had two choices. One, I could dismiss the interest. Or two, check out a few Beatles CDs from the library on the hunch that they'll enjoy it. 
A week or so later, we were at home listening to A Hard Day's Night, Eleanor Rigby, Yesterday. I could sense the first flutterings of Beatlemania in our house. We found pictures of them on the internet. We watched A Hard Day's Night. The obsession grew, and the next step was obvious. Check out a few biographies of the Beatles from the library. You may be thinking, but Angel, a Beatles obsession could lead to a total waste of time, and they could be doing more important things. Pop music, are you kidding me? Imagine your son or daughter at the dinner table sharing stories with you from the Beatles books she's reading. She tells you all about how John Lennon was mostly raised by his aunt and how it affected him emotionally. The day that a friend introduced John and Paul and they hit it off. Disagreements they had along the way. She shows you Liverpool on your wall map and Germany where they first worked eight hours a day as a band playing till two or three in the morning. She borrows piano sheet music of Beatles songs from the library. The trunk of this learning tree is growing taller and broader. As, and as her obsession with the Beatles grows, something else grows inside of her. The roots of curiosity, passion, a desire to develop her own talents, a change in her own character and worldview. She tells you that their music was so powerful that the Beatles influenced an entire generation, the young people of the 1960s. The 60s, when was that? You put a picture of the Beatles on your timeline. The 60s, what else happened in the 60s? John F. Kennedy, Martin Luther King Jr., Andy Warhol, the geodesic dome, Vietnam, branches begin to grow from the trunk of your learning tree. Andy Warhol, is painting a soup can really art? What is he trying to tell us? How did his art influence the thinking of the 60s? Or was it influenced by the thinking of the 60s? Let's paint. Did you know Andy Warhol created a portfolio of Martha Graham? She didn't start dancing until she was 18, and she's been called the Picasso of modern dance. What does that mean? Your children try to move their bodies like Martha, expressing ideas and emotions through dance. You watch a video of Martha Graham's company rehearsal, at which they have a special guest, Helen Keller. You watch Helen reach out to feel the dancers' bodies as they move, standing in the center of their circle. She feels the vibrations of music in the floor and air. It's beautiful, says Helen. Why can't she see or hear? How did she learn to talk? The geodesic dome, Buckminster Fuller, architect, futurist, developed the mathematics of the geodesic dome. How does it support itself? What is tensegrity? It's one of the most stable three-dimensional shapes. Let's build one with toothpicks and clay. Did you know there's a geodesic dome on the South Pole? Who are the first people to visit the South Pole anyway? Martin Luther King Jr. Your whole family sits down to watch the black and white film footage of his epic speech. You are all moved by his words. I have a dream that my four little children will one day live in a nation where they, will, where they will not be judged by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. I have a dream today. You put a picture of him on the timeline. Mom. Why were people treated so unfairly because of the color of their skin? Why don't we all have the same color skin? What makes a person's skin darker or lighter anyway? Why would God allow slavery to happen? Mom, Abraham Lincoln is an amazing person. Did you know he grew up in a log, in a log cabin 
and was almost entirely self-educated? I have a dream that one day this nation will rise up and live out the true meaning of its creed. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. Mom, I want to memorize the entire Declaration of Independence and understand what it means. Will you help me? John F. Kennedy. You watch the grainy 8mm film footage of John F. Kennedy riding in a convertible with his sweetheart, Jackie, when suddenly he collapses against her shoulder. Your heart pounds against your chest and a lump wells up in your throat as Jackie clamors over the back of the car. Why did Lee Harvey Oswald want to kill the president, Mom? In 1961, JFK, JFK declared that, we'll put a man on the moon by the end of the decade and return him safely home. Although he didn't live to see it, in July 1969, Neil Armstrong made one small step for man and one giant leap for mankind. The moon, space travel. Why do things float in space, Mom? Why do astronauts need to wear special gear? How can they jump so high on the moon? Why did we call it the space race? Who were we racing? The Russians? Mom, what was it like living in Russia? What is communism? Anastasia was a real princess? Let's learn Russian. The Chernobyl nuclear disaster. A learning tree, one of many we are perpetually growing in our family. All this from a song they liked, a tiny seed of interest that I could have easily cast aside on rocky ground and let it die out. I chose to plant the seed in fertile ground with plenty of room to grow. I had no idea what this seed of interest would turn into or if it would grow into anything at all. You cannot predict what a seed of interest will grow into, <coughs> just like Sofia Kovalevskaya had no idea that her love of poetry would grow into mathematics. These people, ideas, and events are not just connected like links in a chain. The branches have grown from the trunk and continue to be supported by it. A learning tree cannot be manufactured quickly on an assembly line or planned out 12 years in advance. It is grown slowly, line upon line, precept upon precept. A learning tree grows in your heart and your mind. It changes who you are. I'd like to conclude with a story shared by Sir Ken Robinson. Death Valley is the hottest, driest place in the United States, and so nothing grows there because it doesn't rain. In the winter of 2004, however, it rained in Death Valley. Seven inches of rain fell over a very short period of time. And in the spring of 2005, there was a phenomenon. The whole floor of Death Valley was carpeted in flowers for a while. What it proved was this. Death Valley is not dead. It is dormant. Just underneath the surface are seeds of possibility, just waiting for the right conditions to grow and flourish. But in the ecology of learning, you don't have to wait and hope and pray for it to rain. Because in the ecology of learning, you are the rainmaker. Thank you.